Jesus on his throne, riches in glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace, more and more about Jesus, more and more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. We had spaghetti and garlic toast, garlic bread, breadsticks for dinner, and all the peppermints are gone, just so you know. They, they went and ate that garlic, and then they got the peppermint. so praise the Lord for that. Glad we could help you out in your time of need, amen? Uh, one announcement, and we'll receive our offering. Uh, the teens next Wednesday night are going to an Awakening Youth Rally. You remember back in November, we hosted that youth rally here. We saw four saved. And so our teens, our junior high and high school, will be going to another awakening rally. Next Wednesday in Kahoma, we'll be taking vans out there. So if you have teenagers uh, that need a ride, they'll go out there, and then we'll bring them back here. Uh, and you can see Brother TJ, the times, uh, they're going to leave here at 6, and then they'll be back here about 8.45. So if you need a ride, see Brother TJ and he'll make sure that happens. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together. We thank you for the time of fellowship that we've enjoyed already around the, the dinner table. And we pray now your blessings upon us as we gather in your word and learn more about you. And uh, Lord, just help it to make a difference in our lives. We pray your blessings now upon this offering as well. Lord, let it be sufficient to meet the needs of our ministry around the world and bring honor and glory to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. time favorite songs till the storm passes by i love that song if you would let's all stand don't need to turn to your hymnals i've got the words on the screen join us as we sing as the deer panteth for the water join us as we sing both first and the last verses as the deer panteth for the water so my soul longeth after thee you alone are my heart's desire desire and I long to worship thee. I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength spirit yield. You alone 
Thank you. You may be seated, Pastor. Come right ahead. Amen. Good evening. Glad to see all of you here tonight. If you need a copy of the bulletin uh, with the announcements and the diagrams and all that information, raise your hand. We've got some diagrams in there from some of the subjects that we're going to be talking about tonight. And so that way you can have them up close and look at them uh, and hopefully see what we're talking about. We're uh, doing a series on Bible geography uh, simply because we took a group from our church to Israel back at the end of November, first part of December, and uh, had such a good time. I had several folks ask me if, if I would share uh, the things that we saw and some of the things that we learned, and so certainly I'll be happy to do that. I want to thank uh, Donna Bennett. Donna took notes everywhere we went. She kept a, a travel journal, uh, and she kept those notes, and then when she got home, she typed all those notes up, and she made them available to all of the people who went on the trip. And I appreciate that because my head was just swimming every night when we got back to the hotel because we had seen and experienced so much, and uh, her notes helped me tremendously in getting ready. Uh, Beverly Silen, who is not in here, uh, but Beverly was wise enough to take a recorder with her. And she sat at the front of the bus near the travel, the tour guide. And she recorded Bernice's voice. And so I can hear Bernice now in my sleep. Uh, but uh, what, what Donna didn't cover, Beverly's recordings cover. And so there's that. And then uh, I, I got Paula's uh, pictures. Uh, and so between their pictures and my pictures... Uh, and some of you took pictures, and, and you said that you would share those with me, and I, I, I hope that you do. I'd like to put a, a thumb drive together for everybody of all of the things, not for everybody, but everybody that went on the trip, of all of the things that we saw, because you saw things I didn't see, and you took pictures of things I didn't see. So I appreciate all of those uh, who have helped. Tonight we're going to talk about two cities in particular, but then I decided to add uh, the city of Tiberias. And if you're looking at that map there in your bulletin, Tiberias sits on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And the picture you see here is a picture of sunset. Uh, and from your perspective, over to the right uh, is the southern and uh, I guess that's sun, that would be sunrise because sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So that's a sunrise. Because over to the left is the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. Over to your left would be the northern end where the city of Capernaum would be. So that would be sunrise on the Sea of Galilee. This picture, uh, this is, I was uh, on the fifth floor of the hotel overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And I know this was sunrise. This was the first morning that we got there. This was before the rest of the group arrived. Uh, and I got up that morning because of jet lag. It was about 4.30 in the morning when I just woke up and couldn't go back to sleep. And so I went roaming the city of Tiberias all by myself. And I found all kinds of stuff at 5 o'clock in the morning. I was the only guy out there. And, and what a blessing. Me and the Lord had a good time uh, walking on the, the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and this is standing on my balcony looking out uh, across there. If you... If you could see far enough, uh, the Jordan River and the country of Jordan are way, way off in the distance there. Uh, and then this was that earlier that morning, I was down on the seashore uh, watching the sun come up. These were fishermen going out, uh, getting ready for their day on the Sea of Galilee. And so I wanted to just share a little bit with you about Tiberias because I found it very interesting. I, I walked a lot throughout Tiberias. Now, Tiberius is only mentioned one time in Scripture, uh, and that's in John chapter 6 and verse 23. And the context there, in John chapter 6, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. The crowd is gathered around. And Jesus has, has departed that night, and he's gone up to Capernaum. And the next morning, the crowd wakes up, and they realize Jesus is gone. And so they begin to follow him. They look for him and find out that he's in Capernaum. And John chapter 6 and verse 23 says, 
that there were people and boats that came from Tiberias. Now, the reason Tiberias is not mentioned more in Scripture, and as far as we know, Jesus never went to the city of Tiberias. Tiberias was founded in 20 AD uh, by the, one of the sons of Herod the Great. His name was Herod Antipas. Uh, and let me just tell you, if, if you like history and you like a, a, a great uh, family drama, you ought to study the family of Herod the Great, because, oh my goodness, that's nothing but drama. Uh, Herod the Great was crazy. Uh, he was paranoid, thought everybody was out to get him, and, and uh, so he killed a lot of people, including a lot of his own family members. Uh, but his son, Herod Antipas, founded this city in 20 A.D. Uh, so Jesus, by that point, would have been about 24, 25 years old when the city was founded. But uh, it's interesting because when they started excavating to build this city, they came across a cemetery, this huge ancient cemetery that nobody knew was there. Well, word spread, and because of Old Testament uh, laws, the Jews would not go in a place that had been, buried, uh, been built on top of burial ground. And so this place was off limits to the Jews. They wouldn't go there because they would not... Uh, get themselves uh, ritually unclean by coming in contact with the dead. Now, for whatever reason, I had pictures, and I didn't put them in here, but there is a huge Jewish cemetery there now. And as you approach that cemetery, uh, there's a whole line of sinks. And there's sinks up here, and there's sinks down there, so that when you go to the cemetery, when you come out, you can wash your hands and you can wash your feet and cleanse yourself ritually, having come in contact with the dead. But this huge cemetery was built up on a hill, uh, and, and all of the, 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 what we would call a headstone, they would call, it looked like a box. Uh, and in that box built onto the ends are these little windows where you can light candles and close the windows so the wind won't blow them out. And it's, it's fascinating to look at and look at all the dates and, and things like that. Uh, but you say, well, if, if the Jews never went there, why is there a Jewish cemetery? Well, after 70 A.D., when the Jews uh, revolted against the Romans and lost, uh, the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem and dispersed all of those Jews living there. And so the Sanhedrin, we talked about them last Sunday morning. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin relocated their headquarters here. Uh, there became a... Their, uh, developed a large rabbinical school. Suddenly, you know, with the temple gone and, and all of that thrown out the window, the Jews decided, hey, this is as good a place as any. Uh, let's rebuild here. Uh, and so throughout history, the Jews had a presence in Tiberias. Later on, the Mishnah and the Torah would be written here. The Mishnah was the oral traditions of the rabbis, uh, their interpretation of the Old Testament. And so eventually all of those things got written down. And then the Torah was the interpretation of the interpretation. And so all of that came about. Now, let me back up. From our hotel, and really you can't see it from here, but if you look straight down from my fifth floor window, there are three rabbinical schools uh, right there just outside of our hotel. And every morning we could sit there and we could watch all of these Hasidic Jews with their black hats and their little curly ringlets and their black robes coming in. And they would sit all day long. That's what they did is they would sit and they would study the Old Testament scriptures. They would study the Mishnah and the Torah. Uh, and in fact, our tour guide told us that this is becoming a huge social problem in Israel because Israel subsidizes students. And so now everybody wants to be a student, and you've got a lot of folks who are studying and reading all day long, and they don't want to support their families. They're letting the government of Israel support their families. And so I just thought that was interesting that uh, we were there, and, and you got to see all of that. Uh, this is where our, our first hotel was, and of course from here we traveled all over. Now tonight, the two cities that I want to talk about, and they are there on that map uh, is 
Caesarea Maritime or Maritima. That's on the western coast uh, of Israel. They're on this, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. The other city is Caesarea Philippi, which is in the east, a little bit up uh, on the north, away from the, uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And so I chose these two because they're similar in name, but I also chose them because I was just fascinated by the ruins that were there and the story that can be told from each of these cities. And so uh, I, I did my best to find diagrams. And on the back of your uh, bulletin, uh, you, did, you, you would think with the Internet we'd just be able to find these things. And I couldn't. I had to scan these out of books that I bought. Uh, by the way, these books are in our library, if you haven't gone by there. Uh, the Holy Land, The Land of Jesus, uh, and Daily Life at the Time of Jesus. We bought these while we were over there. And these are available in our library if you want to check them out. They're great. It's mostly pictures and maps, so you don't have to be afraid of words or anything like that. These are easy reading. Uh, I, I love these. These are, I don't know if I can tell you, I'll tell you, these are great in the bathroom, just so you know. But, uh, but not if you checked them out of the church library. Let me just say that. Did I cover that okay, Sherry? Was, uh, my wife's dying right now. I'm sorry. But anyway, this, uh, this diagram is on the back of your bulletin, and, and I couldn't make it super big. But this is Caesarea Maritime or Maritima. Now, the Bible simply refers to it as Caesarea. The name Maritime or Maritima was added later on to distinguish it from the other Caesarea in the eastern part of the country. And as you can probably guess, the word Maritime is related to marine. It's on the coast. It's a, a naval port. It's a, it's, a, it's a place for ships and uh, harbor and all of those sorts of things. Now, this city was built by Herod the Great. He was the king of the Jews at the time Jesus was born. He started building this city in 25 B.C., and it wasn't finished until about 12 B.C., and it actually continued to grow. By the way, uh, as I mentioned about the story of Herod, Herod was probably the greatest architect or one of the greatest architects in human history. He built more buildings and palaces and cities than, than the Egyptians did. Uh, there is a great video on YouTube uh, put out by National Geographic called uh, Herod's Lost Tomb. And they do computer holographic images of some of these places. And you can go on YouTube and you can watch it. It's called Herod's Lost Tomb uh, National Geographic. It's about 45 minutes long. It's an, it's an excellent thing to watch. Uh, but anyway, he built this city, and it became the capital, the Roman capital in Judea. So whenever the Romans in Rome needed to, co to communicate with Judea or what we know as Israel, that's where they would be. All of the uh, leaders had homes in this city. Herod had a huge palace there. Uh, if you're looking at that diagram down at the bottom right-hand side, that building that juts out into the water was Herod's palace. I'm going to show you pictures of that in just a moment. Uh, there are relics of that. The, the, the building itself doesn't stand, but there's enough there. We can see where this palace used to stand. Uh, Pilate, uh, the man who sentenced Jesus to death, he lived here. This is where he lived. And then he would travel the 60 miles down to Jerusalem when he needed to oversee the festivals that the Jews were, uh, uh, were celebrating and things like that. This stood as the capital of Judea for over 600 years. It grew and grew. Uh, it had a presence during the Byzantine Empire during the time of the Crusades. Unfortunately, uh, we never got past, really never got past, Herod's palace. We got to see the amphitheater. We got to walk around the hippodrome a little bit. But this place is so huge that we just never got the chance to explore it all. When we go back in two years, I've already talked to our, our tour director. And I said, I want more time 
in this city. Uh, we, we, just, we need to be able to explore the Crusader Castle and uh, the Artificial Harbor and, and all of those things. Uh, and so for over 600 years, this city stood as the capital. And it was during the Seventh Crusade, the Sultan of Egypt had come up from the south. And uh, he sent his soldiers over the wall and he conquered this city. And from there it just began to disintegrate and people moved out and moved away uh, until it became uninhabited. Uh, it's interesting, for those of you who, who care about these kind of things, the only golf course in all of Israel, the only one, is located in this area. The prime minister has a private home. A lot of wealthy people still have homes in this area. But I just thought that was interesting. I don't play golf, but the only golf course in all of Israel is up here in the north at Caesarea uh, Maritima. Uh, and so uh, let me just show you some of these slides that I've got. Now, this, as you, as you approach the amphitheater, uh, and I guess you can see that's a big giant foot. Imagine what the rest of that statue looked like, okay? Uh, there's a lot of statuary that has just been uncovered and, and it's just laying all over the place. And so they've gathered all of these statues right there at the front as you approach the amphitheater. And it's just fascinating to look at these. One of the things that, that uh, fascinates me is that the heads are missing. You say, well, why did they take the heads? Well, have you ever seen fancy homes? Remember the old Batman TV show in the 60s where Batman would have the, the, the bust and he'd pull the head off and he'd hit the button and go down to the bat cave? That's about the depth of my, my you know, theology. But you see, in, in wealthy people's homes, they have these busts. That's where they got them from. They knocked the heads off statues and they used them to decorate their homes. Their houses weren't big enough to put the entire statue but that could stick somebody's head on the dining room table, I guess. It's kind of weird. And so you see these things all over, and there are, there are bits of columns and capitals and, and those sorts of things. Now, this is the entrance, one of the entrances, going into the amphitheater. Okay? Imagine going into a large sports arena, and you walk up, and you enter in here, and then you come into this wide open area. Uh, Little known fact, okay, for those of you who've just had a big meal. In Latin, this entrance is called the vomitorium. Because when the play is over, when the, the performance is over, the stadium vomits the people back out, I guess is why they named it that. But that's literally the name for an entrance to a stadium is the vomitorium. Uh, here's another one. This is going into uh, the amphitheater. Now, I showed you this picture. This is kind of interesting because if you look to the right as you're going in, you see that little white door in the wall? This is actually, the, the archway that you see is actually the ruins of the Byzantine Empire. The, the Crusaders would have built this. And they built this over top of the ruins that were there from the time of the Apostle Paul. And all of our folks are in there right now. You can see some of them. I think that's Paula standing there with her back to you. Uh, and all of our church members uh, are, are down there listening to Pastor Dunlop preach. And me and a couple of guys are roaming around because we have short attention spans and we can't listen to a lot of preaching. Ironic, isn't it? And so I came up behind the crowd and I saw this little door and there was no lock on it. So I opened the door and I discovered all of these ruins from the time of the Apostle Paul. And so I'm climbing up in there because I think this is the perfect place to get a rock for my Holy Land collection. And rumor has it that there, there is video of me climbing in that door and stealing antiquities from Israel. I don't know why I'm telling you this. It's going out on the internet. I'm kidding. I didn't steal antiques. I promise. Uh, but I think Scott Burt has that video somewhere. So hopefully he never gets mad at me and has to use that. Uh, this, of course, is the amphitheater. And it's so big I had to show it in, in two pictures. In the background is the Mediterranean Sea. So you would come in 
uh, if you were living at the time of Paul, you would come in and you would sit down and the Mediterranean Sea is right behind there. It's all outdoors and you would be able to hear the ships coming in and out of the harbor uh, at night and, and those sorts of things. This is the other side of the amphitheater. This amphitheater would hold anywhere between 3,500 and 5,000 people at a time. And they would come in there and they would do uh, live plays. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, the word hypocrite comes from this time period. The Greek word hypocritos means an actor who plays a role or who wears a mask. Only men were in the theater. And the men would play all of the roles and then they would use different masks to help the audience determine which role that they were speaking at that time. Uh, there's a diagram, and, and I don't know how well you can see that, especially if you're at the back, uh, if you want to see these slides later on. Uh, but it actually had a covering on it. And the, the stage were these mock buildings that were there, and they could change them out, just like they would in a regular theater, as it were. Uh, but the, the Greeks and the Romans... Uh, they loved all of that, that tragedy and that drama and the comedy. And, and folks would come out uh, by the, the thousands. Now, the thing is, it offended the Jews. The Jews were greatly offended because they, they had some, some risque things going on uh, in the theater. And, and their, their humor was very low and very base. And so for devout Jews, you wouldn't expect to find them in the amphitheater. In fact, you wouldn't find a lot of Jews living in Caesarea uh, at all during this time period because it was more of a Greek and Roman place. All of those statues were of gods and goddesses, and the Jews were greatly offended at that. You know, the Jews had spent 70 years in Babylon learning not to be idolaters. And when they got to come home, they learned that lesson well, and they were very offended by the Romans who worshiped you know, almost anything that moved. Uh, but look at your Bible, and I've given you these verses. Open your Bible to the book of Acts, because I want you to see that these are, these are very real places in, in the Word of God. And that's, that's what going to Israel does, is it colors in the lines. It, gives, it makes the Bible three-dimensional. It makes it real. Because now you've seen it, you've walked where they've walked. And when you go back to the Bible, you can't help but have a point of reference. Look at Acts chapter 8, uh, verse 40. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 40, it says, But Philip was found at uh, Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, Philip was one of the deacons in the church at Jerusalem. Later on, he would wind up way far south, witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, Caesarea is 60 miles from Jerusalem. So you get an idea of how far he had to walk. Later on in Acts chapter 21, I don't think this is in your notes, but in Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9, Paul arrives in Caesarea and he stays at Philip's home. So Philip, this Jewish man who was a deacon in the church at Jerusalem, finds himself living in this Roman slash Greek city and his culture. Philip had four daughters, uh, and uh, Philip wound up staying there and being a gospel witness in this very wicked, wicked city. Look at Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, we, we are introduced to a man by the name of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius is the first Gentile in the book of Acts to get saved. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, Peter uh, has been staying in Joppa which is just south on the coast uh, from this city. Uh, he was staying at a, at a man by the name of Simon's house. And do you remember the story? Peter uh, had the vision of the animals coming down in the sheet, and the Lord said, take and eat. And Peter says, oh, no, Lord, I can't. Those are unclean animals. And the Lord says, Peter, I made those. Don't say that I, I've made anything unclean. Did you ever stop and think about this? Peter was staying in Simon the Tanner's house. Peter had no problem staying in a ritually unclean home where there were dead animals, and they were unclean animals also, 
Peter had no trouble sleeping there, but he didn't want to eat, and he didn't want... What was happening is Peter was being a phony in front of the Lord, and the Lord called him on it. And so while he was there in Joppa, somebody came and got him and said, hey, you need to go up to Caesarea. There's a Roman official up there by the name of Cornelius, and he's asking for you. And so Peter goes up there in Acts chapter 10 and verse 24. It says, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, why do you suppose he would worship him? Because Cornelius is living in this city surrounded by all of these statues of gods and goddesses. And Peter's coming in as an authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what they did. Hey, he's deity. We're going to bow down. We're going to worship him. And Peter goes on to say, get up, man. I'm just, I'm just a guy like you are. Look at, uh, 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 well, you can read the entire chapter. He goes on to preach, and uh, they get saved. Uh, and this transition takes place because now the Gentiles have started getting saved. They've started getting filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now Peter's got to go back to Jerusalem and explain to the church there that, hey, this, this Jesus thing isn't just for Jews. It's also for Gentiles. Later on in Acts chapter 18, we find that Peter, uh, Paul winds up here and he sails from here on his first missionary journey or his second missionary journey. Later on, Paul's going to come back to Jerusalem. He's going to report to the church there. He's going to give them a love offering because a famine has taken place. And then Paul is going to wind up going through the temple. He goes through the temple, I believe it's with Timothy, uh, and, and it almost starts a riot. Okay, And they arrest him, and they wind up sending him here to Caesarea. Look at Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. In Acts chapter 23, look at uh, verse 23. Now he's being sent to Caesarea, it says, And he, Felix, called unto him two centurions. Okay, a centurion is a Roman soldier who is in charge of a hundred other Roman soldiers. So he calls two centurions saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea. And horsemen, three score and ten, and spearmen, two hundred, at the third hour of the night. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. They were bringing him from Jerusalem to this city. It took two hundred soldiers to guard Paul. That's how intimidated they were by the gospel that he was preaching. They brought spearmen, they brought horsemen, they brought all of this entourage, and Paul is going to Caesarea. Can you imagine when he walks into the city of Caesarea? Everybody knows he's there, and everybody is talking. But they go to this theater, and they're sitting there, and before the play even starts, they're talking about this new prisoner that the Romans have brought in. During intermission, they're talking about this new prisoner that the Romans have brought in. Look at uh, chapter 24, verse 27. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room. That means Felix died, Festus took his job, or Felix lost his job and Festus took his job. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So Paul winds up being in prison here for two years. You can go on and read chapter 25. He's brought before Herod Agrippa. Okay? That's a grandson of King Herod. They bring him into, uh, remember I told you Herod built this palace. Let me go back here. Got to go all the way back. And then we, I told you Herod built this palace. His grandson is now the one occupying this palace. And he has a judgment hall towards the back of this building. And he desires to meet with Paul and find out what's going on. And so in Acts chapter 25, they go into Herod's judgment hall. And there, in Herod's judgment hall, uh, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Oh, this is Herod's palace. Okay, uh, Here in the forefront, you see this little white square? 
Those are floor tiles that remain to this day from the floor of Herod's palace. Folks, that's two, over 2,000 years old. Uh, we've had linoleum that didn't last that long. Uh, but you can see the floor. In the background, they believed he had an indoor swimming pool, and they believe that that is the remains of that indoor swimming pool. Here's uh, an up close. Uh, doesn't look very deep, but back in the day it would have been deep. Silt has filled it in. Uh, and then this is an up close shot of, of those floors. But in the back side of this palace was the judgment hall. This is his, uh, the well that would provide water. This is the Roman aqueduct that still exists today. Uh, the Romans built that back in the turn of that century, that first century, still standing today. Uh, these are columns from Herod's palace. Those, those rails in the back, those are modern day to keep Americans from falling off the edge because, you know, we're looking at our cell phones and not paying attention to where we're going. But the columns are from Herod's palace. And it's this place right here that I wanted you to see. They believe this is the very place where Paul stood. And as you read Acts 25 and in Acts 26, he gives his testimony about being on the road to Damascus and seeing the bright light and uh, how Christ changed him. And then they ask him a couple of questions. And Paul, being a Roman citizen, says, I appeal to Caesar. And Agrippa says, then to Caesar thou shalt go. And it's from this city Paul will board a ship and he will go to the city of Rome. And there he will wait in prison uh, for an audience with King Nero. And in 68 AD, Paul will die in the city of Rome. He will be beheaded two years before uh, the Colosseum in Rome was built. And so we got to spend some time there. We got to walk around. Uh, I, do I have a picture of, yes, this is the Hippodrome. This is where they would have the chariot races. If you've ever seen the movie Ben-Hur, you're kind of familiar with it. Uh, they, would, they would go down. There would have been over here to the far right where you see these couple of people standing. There would have been these large columns, and there would have been like a guardhouse or something in there. And they would have raced those chariots around. And the floor was, was sand because if you got thrown out of one of those chariots, uh, you were, you know, You'd be laying there, and another chariot would come and, and run you over, and you'd just be a greasy spot in the sand, and they'd, you know, pile some kitty litter on top of you and go on with their business. It was a very violent time, and, and folks, thousands of folks would be lining these stands, cheering and waiting for the next guy to die and his blood to be spilled. Do you see what a, a, a horror? I mean, we look at this and we go, how fascinating. But to the Jews, th this place was abhorrent to them because life had no value whatsoever everything was about entertainment everything was about uh feel good and eat good and look good and go to places and be seen not a whole lot has changed in culture over the years has it and so from there we go to the next place and again this diagram this artist rendition is in your uh, uh your bulletin this is a place called caesarea philippi uh, and it's mentioned uh, in the New Testament. Go in your, look in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 17. I don't think this is in your notes. But look at 2 Kings chapter 17. Caesarea Philippi was up in the far north. And the, the northern part of Israel, uh, there at the headwaters of the Jordan River, uh, is a very green, very luscious place. Lots of trees, lots of groves, lots of water. Uh, so it's a very fertile place. And during the Old Testament time, there was a temple dedicated to the worship of Baal. In 2 Kings chapter 17. And folks, I could tell you some horrible, horrible things about the worship of Baal. They sacrificed children. They believed in human sacrifices, uh, the sacrifice of virgins and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, it was a very sensual religion. Uh, and don't let your mind wander too much on that, but it was, it was horrible. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 17, look at verse 9. It says, And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen, 
whom the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. And so this was one of those places in the Old Testament where these sorts of things took place. And over time it grew and uh, it would die off and others would move in. Folks would conquer and move in and uh, things like that. So that when we get to the New Testament, uh, again, Herod the Great, who was this tremendous builder, built this city over the remains that were there from Old Testament times. Uh, He built it starting in about uh, 20 B.C. And it started out with this white palace. If you're looking, look to the left. Those four, that that building to the far left with those four columns. He built that building. It was a temple dedicated to the worship of Zeus. Now, Herod was an Idumean. Okay? That means he's half Jew, half Gentile. He knows his Jewish history. He knows that it offends the Jews, that he does these sorts of things. That's why he built the temple in Jerusalem. Because he had made them so mad, he thought, well, I'll build them their own temple, and they'll get off my back. But he wanted to appease as many people as possible uh, so they wouldn't try and kill him. Because, again, he's crazy. He's thinking everybody's out to get him. So he builds this temple dedicated to Zeus in 20 B.C. Later on, Herod dies in 4 B.C. And his son, another son, Herod Philip, inherits this part of his territory from Caesar. And so he changes the name to Caesarea Philippi. By then, Caesar Augustus, who this was named for, has died. Caesar Tiberius is now on the throne in Rome. And Herod Philip learned from his father, you've got to keep everybody happy. So he changed the name to honor himself. Caesarea Philippi. But then he wrote a letter and said, wink, wink, I named it for you because you're Caesar. And Tiberius, I guess, said, okay, fine, whatever. I've got other places named for me too. And so he dedicated it to uh, the emperor Tiberius. Now, here's another picture. This has got a lot of words. I'm not sure that you can see it. This, you can find this picture on the internet. Okay, This is an artist's rendition of what this city might have been like. And it backed up to Mount Hermon one of the highest points in all of Israel. What I, I got this here because I wanted you to see the word Benaiah. And in your notes, I think I put Panaeus and Benaiah. Now, the Greeks and the Romans knew this city as Panaeus, the city of Pan. This was the headquarters for the worship of the god, the Greek god, Pan. Half man, half goat. Okay, you've seen that uh, if you read A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare. Pan's involved in that. Pan flutes come from there because those flutes were used in the worship of Pan. Pan was a god of nature. Uh, he was a fertility god. Uh, he, was, he was a sexual deity. And so the Greeks and the Romans knew this as Panaeus. The Arabs called it Benaeus because there's no letter P in Arabic. And so they called it Bunias B instead of Panaeus with a P. And so this was all greatly dedicated to the worship of pagan gods and goddesses. Now, uh, let me go back to this picture. Look at this in your, in your notes. Okay? The building on the far left, as I've already mentioned, is the building that's dedicated to the worship of Zeus. Look very carefully behind that building. There is a large cave opening behind this building, okay? Don't forget about that. I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a minute. As you move to the right, there's an open area with some alcoves carved into the wall. Those alcoves still exist today. That's known as the court of Nemesis. Nemesis was a goddess of vengeance. And so if you got mad at somebody and you wanted the gods to get them for you, you would make your way to Caesarea Philippi, you would go to the court of Nemesis, and you would pay the priest to cast a spell upon them. And that's where that is. That's the court of Nemesis. 
you go to the next building uh, to the right of that, uh, and I'm not sure what that building is. Uh, it, it's Greek revival. Well, it wasn't revival at the time. It was Greek new then. Now it's called Greek revival. But another temple. But go, go to the far right and look at the building in the foreground, that white area, that wide open area. That's called the Court of the Dancing Goat. And there's a platform at the front of that uh, where, where instrumentalists would come and they would play and they would bring goats from the building in the back. And they would play music, and, and it would stir up the goats, and the goats would prance around. And that was a fertility rite. Okay? And it wasn't a fertility rite for the goats. It was a fertility rite for the people. And I have to be careful, because we, we talked about things on the bus I don't know that we need to talk about in here. Okay? Uh, and so we're all grown-ups. Let me, let me see if I can explain this to you. I, it's important that you understand this for what happens here. That building on the far right in the back is where they kept all of the goats. All right? Now hold that thought. Let me show you what these look like today. Okay? As you're uh, walking in, this, uh, where you are seated would be where that temple of Zeus is. And this would be a river. This would be, uh, annually, the Jordan River would flood. And it would come out of that hole in that cave. And it would flood this area. And this would normally be filled with water. When we were there, it didn't have any water in it, okay? So behind me would be the temple of Zeus. Then we go on. This is standing up on a hill. To the left would be that hole, and where all these people are standing is where that temple dedicated to Zeus once stood. On down you would see uh, the court of Nemesis and the place where the goats are. We'll get there, okay? Here's that hole that I told you about. Now, the Jordan River runs underground here. And different times of the year, the water would flood down after the waters would melt off of the mountains in the north. It would come down, and the flood waters would gush out of this cave. And it was at those times of the year that people would bring their human sacrifices, and they would throw them in that hole. Okay? This is the kind of things that are taking place at Caesarea. We go on. This is moving on down. This is the hole. We're moving on down the hill now. Uh, one of the things that I really found fascinating was these lifelike statues that they had there. I mean, they looked almost human, uh, except for that guy. He didn't look human at all. Uh, and then, you know, those statues just go crazy. <laughs> now, the reason I show you this picture, besides to embarrass my wife, is because you remember the statues I showed you earlier that were all white? In the days of Jesus, in the days of Paul, this is what they would have looked like. They would have been painted to look like human beings. They would have been very vibrant colors because they were worshiping deities. They weren't just white marble statues. They had been painted to look like gods and goddesses. And over time, the wind and the elements have sanded them down to the bare element. But this is what they would have looked like in the days of Jesus and the days of Paul. This column right here that, that we are standing by is one of those four columns in that middle building that's still standing today. Uh, this is where I wanted to get us to, though. This is where they kept the goats. And if you kind of look, there's a, there's a row of cubby holes going up at an angle. And these cubby holes were cages or pens for the goats. Now, I, I don't mean to get graphic, but again, I think it's important for you to understand what we're about to, to, to hear. These goats were used for religious purposes in human fertility rites. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. If, if you need help, see me later and I'll, I'll explain to you, okay, further. But these goats were there and you could come up and you could worship with the goat of your choice. Because goats were the way to worship Pan, the god of nature, the god of fertility, okay? 
Now, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. You thought human nature was depraved today. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. We're just as gross now as we've ever been, humanly speaking. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi is nowhere near the ocean. Okay? It sits on a, a, a valley, or three valleys that connect, and the Jordan River runs through them. But that's the only source of water. When Matthew says Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, it means he came close to the city, but he was not going inside that city. And you understand why now. And he took his disciples up there. He's got the apostles with him, and they're going up there for a time away from the crowds. And you say, why in the world? That's like Jesus taking his apostle to Las Vegas. You say, why would Jesus take them there? I'm going to show you. He asked his disciples there in that place, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now imagine, here's the backdrop. People are there and they are worshiping and they are doing things in the name of religion that you wouldn't even speak about. And there's all of these temples and, and, and buyers and sellers of religion. And on the outskirts of this town, every one of these apostles knows what's going on in that city. And he says, who do you say I am? You see, this is a defining moment in Jesus' ministry, for the apostles and for the entire world. Jesus is drawing a line in the sand, and he's saying, it's now or never. You've got to decide, who do you say I am? And of all people, Peter, Peter, who hadn't gotten the thing right yet, Peter says this, verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is a huge statement. It's huge because Peter said it, but it's huge because in that instance, Peter connected the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. And notice what Jesus says in verse 17. And Jesus answered and he said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah. The word bar means son of. See, Jesus is doing a play on words here with Peter. Peter says, you're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you're the son of Jonah. You see the world of difference between you and me, Peter? I am the son of the living God. I'm not one of these statues. And you're just a man. And he goes on to say, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven... And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, the Catholic Church gets this wrong. The Catholic Church takes this verse, and they said, see right there, Jesus is saying Peter is the Pope. Because Jesus is saying that he's building his church upon Peter. That's not at all what he said. In Greek, he says, thou art Petros, a little rock. But upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Now, the New Testament had not been written. The Old Testament, every one of those men knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. And in the Old Testament, the image of a rock is always, always, always a picture of God. Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm not building my church on you. You're a little pebble. I'm building it upon your statement that I am the son of the living God. I am the rock. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. That rock was Jesus. See, the Catholic Church got that way wrong. Now, notice what else he says there. He says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock 
I will build my church. Do you see the line in the sand he just drew? And then notice, watch the, the next thing he said. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You're never going to guess what that hole in the rock is called. The gates of hell. Where they would throw those human sacrifices, kicking and screaming to their death. Jesus is standing there and folks are dying in the background and the water is rushing and the people are chanting and dancing and doing their thing. And he says, Peter, this is it, man. This is it. The world changes here and the world changes now. And that stuff, it's not going to prevail. I will have the last word. That's some cool stuff. And we got to stand there, stare into that hole. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, again, if you want to get the books out of the library, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll do my best to help you with that. Let's take some prayer requests. Uh, you'll notice there in your prayer booklet, if you receive that, under the hospital, Eula Mae McDaniels, that's Roxy uh, Blair's mom, Many of you know Eula Mae. She's been a member here forever, a uh, uh, long, 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 long time. She's in the hospital over in Midland, had uh, several complications, several different things. Uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to share all of that, but uh, if you would remember to pray for uh, Eula Mae, I'm sure they would, great, um, her and Roxy and the family would appreciate it. Autry Moore, Martha's husband, many of you know Autry. Autry had surgery today uh, in Odessa. They did a triple bypass. He had several blockages that needed to be taken care of. There was a uh, fourth blockage. It's behind the heart. And so they did not attempt to get there and open that one up. They're going to let him recover right now from those, uh, that triple bypass. So if you would remember Autry. Uh, Molly asked that we pray for the entire family. So pray for Molly and Martha and uh, Lindsay and Jalen. Pray for all of them if you would. Those are our hospital uh, request. Uh, on the back, uh, number 21, Rylan Foster. Rylan's having uh, dental surgery tomorrow, having some teeth pulled, having some repairs and things done. Uh, and so remember Rylan, remember his family. Uh, is that going to be in San Angelo, Brother Mark? In Lubbock. Okay. So remember Rylan uh, as he goes and has that dental surgery done. Let me give you these new ones. Don't forget, if you fill out a prayer request form, Fill out the front with a request. Make sure you date it. And then on the back where it says name, put your name. That way we can come and check with you and say, how's this going? What's the update? Has God answered that prayer yet? Uh, please remember Connie Fowler. Uh, this is Bob Eshelman's request. She has cancer, and it is not known at this moment where that cancer is, but they know that it is cancer. Connie Fowler. Fowler, F-O-W-L-E-R. Kathy uh, Green asks that we pray for Brinley Sparks. That's her granddaughter, that situation there in San Angelo. Uh, she asks that we continue to pray for Brinley, B-R-I-N-L-E-Y. Her last name is Sparks. Uh, Charlotte Hall's mom, her name is Betty Brown. Uh, she's fallen a couple of times, uh, and Charlotte is staying with her. And so we uh, want to pray for her mom, Betty Brown. Uh, Mr. Hill, this is uh, Raymond Hall's nurse's husband. Uh, Donna told me the story. I don't remember all of it, but uh, he, was, he was healthy, uh, and then he wasn't. Uh, and now he's in the hospital on life support. So if you would remember Mr. Hill, he's 48 years old. Mr. Hill, I don't know his first name. Uh, Lila Atkins is having neck surgery uh, next Tuesday, January the 22nd. That'll be in Lubbock. Uh, so pray for Lila having neck surgery on Tuesday. Anne Marie Whitmire, this is uh, from Judy Ayer, uh, has cancer. She has been in our bulletin, uh, has cancer. This is the third time. Uh, she will be undergoing radiation treatment to remove a brain tumor before continuing with treatment for pancreatic cancer. 
So let's be sure and pray for Anne Marie Whitmire. W H I T M I R E. Anne Marie Whitmire. Uh, Bert Dickerson's cousin, cousin's wife, uh, Francis Bain, B A E N. Frances Bain has stage four ovarian cancer. She lives in Corpus Christi. Uh, so that's Bert's cousin's wife, Frances Bain. And then pray for Jerry Murphy. This is Angela Kennedy's request. Uh, has pneumonia. So please remember Jerry in your prayers as well. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Choir, you will have practice. Uh, for just a little bit tonight, he's going to ease you back into those waters, but Easter's coming, so just know that you need to go to the choir room uh, for a little bit of practice tonight. Father, we thank you tonight for meeting with us, and Lord, we thank you for your word and, 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 and the reality that these were men and women, these were human beings, Lord, who, who walked these streets and climbed those hills and uh, made those choices, good, bad, and otherwise. Lord, may we learn uh, from their mistakes. May we learn from how they grew closer to you. We pray, Father, that, that your word would be real to us. We pray, Father, that, that we would search your scriptures and uh, in them we would find uh, all that we need to, to master life. We pray tonight, Father, for these requests and those that are mentioned in our booklet. And Lord, we lift up to you those who... Uh, have health problems tonight. We pray for Lila as she goes in for surgery next Tuesday. We pray for Rylan uh, as he goes in for surgery tomorrow. We ask that you'd comfort Eula May, and we pray that, uh, Father, you'd uh, comfort um, uh, Autry there in the hospital. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for strength. We pray for courage during these times. Lord, most of all, we pray that folks would experience your presence, that they would know that you are on your throne, that you work all things together for good. Father, we pray for these other requests, these health concerns, folks that uh, have cancer. God, what a horrible, horrible thing cancer is, and we don't understand it, but we, we know you, and we know that you, you can heal uh, if it's your will, and so, Father, we pray for them. We pray uh, that, again, you would strengthen them, that you would... Uh, give them courage. Lord, we pray for their family members, that they would gather around and they would be a, a support and, and an encouragement. Lord, that they would just feel the love of their family. But again, that they would know your presence. God, we thank you so much for all that you're doing in our church. We thank you for the way that you answer prayers according to your time, according to your will. And Lord, we just ask that, that we would be in, in line with your will that we would be in agreement with you, Lord, that we would not be sinning and getting in the way of what you want us to do. And so, Father, may your Holy Spirit convict us. May he guide us and direct us in, in what we should do and how we should live. We pray, Heavenly Father, this year that you would show us that one thing that, that we need to start, and we need to finish, and we need to perfect in our lives. God, we want to give you honor and glory in that. And so show us what our one thing is. We pray that you'll continue to bless the church and add to the church daily, such as should be added. Lord, I had a great day yesterday. It was such a blessing to me. And Lord, I'm just so thankful for days like that. And so, Father, I, I publicly give you thanks and praise uh, for just walking me through that and, and giving me, God, that divine appointment. I pray that others would know uh, the joy that I have known this week. So bless us, Lord, and keep us safe as we depart this place. Help us to remember that, that we serve you and we wear your name so that you might be honored and glorified. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.